yeah, AOC's presidency would see, would be so dope. She's gonna like wheelie into the uh, the White House, you know, with those uh, the, those shoes that had the wheels on the back that let you skid. It's gonna be like that, okay? She's just gonna do that everywhere in the White House. It'll be great. You had a job interview, woohoo, Lulu. I hope you uh, I hope you did very well. Yeah, those Heelys. Presidential kickflips, yeah. I don't think AOC would win the moderates. I think AOC could win the moderates. I, I really do. She's incredibly, incredibly popular. <laughs> I'll put homeless people into camps. Those camps will be made of steel and iron and concrete with nice insulated walls and wood paneling and carpet and running water and electricity and refrigerators and microwaves and ovens and working uh, appliances and all the, all the modern conveniences. And they will like it. I mean, look, guys, I if you look at the trend over the years of like support for socialism and socialist candidates, uh, it's only been going up. Uh, never before has capitalism been as reviled in the United States as it is now. And I think if we give it another couple years, uh, AOC has a really good shot of being able to overcome any like uh, g like genuine opposition from within the DNC. I think that wing of the party is getting old it's dying out, and every election cycle, it gets closer and closer to not being able to stop a socialist from getting into power. Hot water's fancy. True. Do you think Trump will win in 24? In Absolutely. Yeah. It's, like, it's not even close. If you look at Trump's polling numbers, every single poll has him at, like, 70% approval or more. Like, Republicans love Donald Trump. There's not any other Republican politician that comes even close to how much people like Trump. The next closest is, like, uh, DeSantis in Florida, and even he is, like, less than a third of uh, Trump's level of support. Like, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I, I think Trump is gonna run. There, there's absolutely no way he doesn't unless he dies of old age. Hot take, do we have enough time to wait for the old guard to die off before climate change gets bad? Uh, look, I don't I, I don't think we have to wait. Uh, I think the old guard is gone and is weak enough to beat right now. It's not a matter of uh, of waiting anymore. We're we're at the moment. We're like we're we're here. We can beat them. Friend of mine defends capitalism like crazy, thinking he will be a capital owner someday by buying a, con a condo. Good luck with current overpricing of real estate, thanks to capitalism, baby. Yeah, good luck. Yeah, like, Donald Trump already lost the popular vote twice. It's going to be real hard for them to win again, especially if Democrats manage to actually get the, uh, the Voting Act passed. Oh yeah, Clyburn killed him dead in uh, South Carolina, but like, honestly, what really killed him wasn't Clyburn. What killed him was the, uh, was the very sudden, um, uh, convergence of every single other candidate who was standing in opposition to him. Uh, I think that's something that's really hard to pull off, and I don't think it's something that's likely to happen again. Everything's riding on the voting rights bill to an extent. Um, there's also stuff riding on the current infrastructure bill, which has uh, now uh, I, I we, we talked about the infrastructure bill just the other day, but we have new information that has uh, elements of the PRO Act, the uh, 
the Labor Union Act uh, that uh, would support unions and unionization. Uh, parts of that have now been included in the infrastructure budget bill, um, specifically the funding elements of it. So that is going to be passed by reconciliation. Like that that's what's going to happen in that. It's a $3.5 trillion deal, but there's an additional $600 billion being added to it. So it's going to be a $4.1 trillion bill. Um, it's going to be a... It's going to be a big deal. They're they're adding more to it, and they're going to get a lot of stuff done with that bill. Uh, well, I guess this video kind of uh, dovetails nicely with what we were just talking about, so uh, let's check it out. Some uh, good old-fashioned PBS reporting. But the downturn of the pandemic economy has hit many Americans hard. And for a number of millennials born between 1981 and 1996 and Generation Z who follow them, that pain plus a number of other factors are leading some to ask who is responsible. Over the next couple of nights, economics correspondent Paul Salmon is going to examine this generational tension beginning tonight from the perspective of some millennials. Baby boomers, greatest generation, got all the money, now we got the vaccination. On Saturday Night Live this season, an OK Boomer takedown. Got a job out of college, no student debt, retirement funded 100%. It, it just sort of encapsulates this sort of whole sense of unfairness where it's always the boomers first and their kids last. Bruce Gibney, author of A Generation of Sociopaths, How the Baby Boomers Betrayed America, says vaccinating the elderly first made perfect sense from a public health standpoint. The challenge is, is that after years of abusive behavior on the part of the boomers, this, this might be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Gibney says the pandemic has fueled a growing resentment of baby boomers, which he marks a bit earlier, those of us born between 1940 and 65, rather than just after the war. It's a resentment among millennials, 1981 to 1996, whose economic prospects have supposedly been sacrificed to help greedy, ungrateful boomers. True. Oblivious to the realities facing the young. The millennials in Generation Z have the Peter Pan syndrome. They don't ever want to grow up. This 2019 TikTok video helped popularize the phrase, OK Boomer, as a retort to the boomer critique. You're going to mature and you're going to realize nothing's free, that things aren't equal, and that your utopian society you created in your mind in your youth simply is not sustainable. How do real life millennials respond? Very offended, very offended because mm. I am a very hard worker. All we want to do is sit around, watch Netflix or play video games. Like based on everyone I know and even myself, I'm not sure where that notion comes from. The biggest thing is like we want their things, like we want their house and we want their bank account. A boomer myself by Gibney's broader definition, since I was born in 1944, I asked four millennials for their take. 37-year-old Travis Barker lives outside of Denver, Colorado, was laid off during the pandemic. In Gilroy, California, 29-year-old Sonia Reyes, daughter of Mexican immigrants and mother of two, put herself through college, only recently saved enough to move out of her parents' home. Brianna Nicholas, 28, an accountant in Philadelphia, has $200,000 in student debt Jesus. for her degree in historic preservation. And 34-year-old Joe Caputo, in Oklahoma City worked odd jobs for years. All college grads heading toward middle age, scraping by. You know, I, I have a, you know, a four year degree. Uh, I have, you know, honorably discharged in the military. I've worked overseas. Uh, I've never been arrested. I've never failed a class. And yet I still feel like um, I'm behind the eight ball. There's no doubt that you guys had it easier than we do. Like Travis said, no matter what you actually accomplish or feel like you accomplish, you don't feel like you're actually moving forward in life. It's like you don't feel like you can actually become a full adult. We had to move from San Jose to Garoy because San Jose was just too expensive. But you're a two-income family, right? You can't afford even to buy a house in Gilroy? Uh, no, the houses in Gilroy are a bit cheaper than San Jose, but not to like to the point where I by myself and my husband can afford a house. Renting is basically all I kind of see for my wife and I for the foreseeable future. 
um, just because we can budget for it. Okay, we bought houses when they were way cheaper, but does that make us sociopaths? The most important thing about, about sociopaths is that they really they don't have a great sense of, of obligations to, to others. For Bruce Gibney, writer, jackpot winner as an early investor in PayPal and Facebook, the economic anxieties of millennials are the result of decades of sociopathic choices by boomers who grew up in a booming America. They had an enormous tailwind, uh, and they really, they, they decided to set a direction that really only benefited themselves. They, you mean me, right? You mean me and my friends? I do, I do. Every stretch of farm Thanks. and factory to market road earns profits for all the nation. Gibney says we boomers benefited from investments in roads, new schools, education, paid for with taxes on previous generations. But when it was the boomers' turn to give, we continued to take. Tax cuts, expanded Medicare and Social Security, an imbalance that led to an explosion of debt. Gibney points out that when he was born in 1976... Well, expanded Medicare and Social Security, those are good things. The national debt was about a third the size of the annual economy. After decades of boomers at the helm, he says, it's now some 130%. Wings spread and bright, thank you for the follow. And while are the largest portion of the workforce, the Federal Reserve just reported they have less than 5% of the country's wealth. The boom Jesus fuck. <laughs> like... I, I... I don't know. I feel... I feel like such dog shit. I, like... This, this is where I, I put on my hat and I'm just like... Millennials, at this point, like, we're getting... You know, you know, we're kind of getting to that point that is necessary, I think, in a lot of revolutions where people just feel like, what do we have to lose? What are you going to do? You can't take our homes. Our homes, we, do, we don't even own our homes. Like, we, what are you going to take? Our health care? We don't have that. What, what are you going to take from us? Oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a millennial, yeah. Just watched the, this myself yesterday on YouTube. Hey! Uh, this is going to actually dovetail very nicely with uh, a piece that I have following this. So, um, yeah, imagine imagine being able to afford a wedding. Uh, we watched that wedding vi video earlier in uh, the stream. That's like, that wedding alone, like, cost more than every single person watching this takes home in, like, a year. No, not... Like none of the none of the people watching this can afford a wedding like that. And like Gen X is marginally better off, but like not not very much better off, you know? Like, holy shit. Boomers, meanwhile, had four times that percentage at around the same age. Do you blame my generation for the difficulty that the millennials, for example, are now having high college costs, high student debt, uh, can't afford. By, by the way, I, I wouldn't, I, I think the optics of being like, your generation fucked us. I mean, like, to an extent that's true, but the real culprits aren't the entire generation. The real culprits are, um, the people who were in power, the Republicans, the conservatives, the uh, capitalists, uh, those people, the people who built up and eroded our civil rights as regards to our uh, democracy and the money that's allowed into it. Now, granted, uh, the people who empowered them were also members of this generation, but I'm just going to say, like, I think it's better optically to keep the blame where it belongs on uh, the the powerful in our society, and so forth. I do to a to a large degree. I think we see it in the explosion of student debt, which the government didn't even keep records on in the early 1960s because it wasn't economically significant. Today, it's 1.7 trillion dollars. The schools were in excellent shape when the boomers came of age. They are in appalling shape now, worse in the aggregate even than our roads and bridges. That is astonishing levels of political neglect true nothing has been done with respect at a serious level regarding the environment and it's not as if the boomers didn't know that these were going to be problems 
Did the millennial panel agree that the policies that we put in place or just allowed to happen are what have put you at such a disadvantage? That's certainly how it feels to me. After 30, 40 years, you look back on the Seculoid, policies and you thank see- thank you very much for the you know, raid. The gap, uh... Uh, also, welcome raiders. Uh, my name is Riverboat Jack. I'm a lefty socialist. Uh, hit that follow button. And even if you don't want to hit the follow button, please click a little picture of my face below stream so I get credit for your precious, precious eyeballs. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome, Chapoman. Uh, welcome, handsomest robot. I cannot buy your cat. I am very sorry. Um, hey, Morgan the Fay. Uh, Seculoid, I hope you had a fantastic stream. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, how y'all doing, folks? Yeah, hashtag Exxon new, exactly. Welcome, everybody. Happy, uh, happy NB day. Uh, we're just watching a, a piece on uh, boomers and millennials. It's uh, it's pretty in interesting, and we're going to tie that in with a little piece we're going to cover right after. So uh, stick around. Hit Again, hit the follow button, and uh, click the little picture of my face so I get credit for your eyeballs. Uh, we're doing a partner push. Very much appreciate it. Uh, Moro, Moroch Ben Ioff, thank you very much for the follow. We watched Michael Knowles say trans people exist because they aren't Catholic. Uh, on Timcast? Oh my goodness. That sounds horrible. Um, you know, your purchasing power and the cost of education and housing has gone way up compared to wages. And, you know, once you look back on that and you still don't acknowledge um, your part in that, yeah, that's when it kind of becomes hard to understand um, how they justify that. <clears throat> well, they is me, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you. Uh, how do you justify that no um you know I, individually these people i don't i don't think are sociopaths like you referenced that that book but on a policy level absolutely are it's hard to um describe you guys as anything other than that rihanna nicholas had a less clinical diagnosis boomer is kind of like a filler word for status quo like it's not the generation itself it's just the fact that like the unwillingness to understand that things have changed, things are changing, and kind of keep it the way it is because it worked for, for them, assuming that it'll work for everyone else, and that's just not true. But wait a minute. What about the 60s, when boomers worldwide were coming of age and pushing back against previous generations for civil rights, feminism, gay rights? Don't we get credit for that? No, and if you look at the chronology, <laughs> you can see that this is just true. Desegregation of schools, Brown versus Board of Education, 1954. Average boomer is two. Pretty sure they're not in the Supreme Court. Civil Rights Act of 1964. Average median boomer is 12. Again, not a constituency, not in power. Voting Rights Act of 1965. Again, not a constituency, not in power. Median boomer is 13. And so on down the line. And the legion of boomers who started <laughs> Earth Day voted against the tax cuts, carried the flag for social change. Yes, I agree that while boomers are, as individuals, good and bad, just like any other generation, any other group of people, as a political generation, they have systematically favored policies that have benefited themselves at the expense of others. So what now? Any hope for the millennials? Well, we're gonna pass on. And as I pointed out to the panel, the amount of money that boomers have made and saved will go to you all, right? I'm not gonna hold my breath for that. It's a little morbid to have to wait for your relatives to die to have some side, like kind of financial success. I should be able, with my career, with my husband's career, um, you know, be able to save enough money to have financial security plus living in an adequate home. And who's to argue that she shouldn't be? Well, in our next story, we'll hear the somewhat surprising response from boomers themselves. I want to apologize because I don't feel we're leaving a better world for them. For the PBS NewsHour. That was surprisingly kind of cathartic to hear. Now, you might be thinking, well, millennials, just work harder. Just, just, gosh golly, pull up your bootstraps and work harder. You know? Why, why aren't you working harder? Just go out there, start at the bottom, work hard, get to the top, and everything will be fine. Well, 
here's part of the problem. Full-time minimum wage workers can't afford rent anywhere in the United States, according to a new report. <sighs> People working minimum wage jobs full-time cannot afford a two-bedroom apartment in any state in the country, the National Low Income Housing Coalition's annual Out of Reach report finds. In 93% of U.S. counties, the same workers can't afford a modest one-bedroom home, meaning that if you work full-time at minimum wage, there are only se only 7% of places in the United States are places you are going to be able to afford to live in. Only 7% of the United States is livable for a full-time employee at minimum wage. Uh, the report defines affordability as the hourly wage a full-time worker must earn to spend no more than 30% of their income on rent, in line of what most budgeting experts recommend. This is true. Uh, the, the, like, day one advice you will get from everyone is that you should spend no more than 30% of your income on rent. I don't know any of my friends, except for the absurdly wealthy ones, uh, who, who are able to budget like that like at all go puff turned me down for a 13 dollar per hour uh job as an order filler due to not having a four-year degree yeah like what ha, pay, pay rent with what money pay rent with what money like when you're done with student loans when you're done with like medical expenses because guess what some of us have chronic conditions that we need medications for like what do you what do you with what money this year workers would need to earn twenty four dollars and ninety cents per hour for a two bedroom home and twenty dollars and forty cents per hour for a one bedroom rental meaning if you are making less than twenty dollars per hour you're not going to be able to afford a one bedroom rental like When we start talking about this, yeah, and you can't afford rent on disabilities either. Um, yeah, like when we're talking about this, keep in mind, this is why when I talk about advocating for a uh, for minimum wage, I'm like, I, I'm out there saying, nah, nah, guys, we need, we need a $30 per hour minimum wage. What are you talking about? Rent, rent is insane. It's insane. Uh, let's see. So these numbers that I just listed to you, $24.90 and $20.40, that's an increase from $23.90 and $29 or $19.50, meaning that from last year to this year, your hour, your average hourly minimum wage to keep up with rent would have had to go up by a dollar per hour. Most people, when they get a raise, their wage only goes up by, like, a couple cents per hour. Like, the the idea that, like, this is anywhere close to feasible is ridiculous. The average hourly worker currently earns $18.78 per hour. The report finds more than $6 short of the wage needed to afford a two-bedroom rental. And... <laughs> like a uh, several dollars short of being uh, enough for a one bedroom rental given each state and locality's minimum wage the report finds that the average minimum wage worker in the united states would need to work for nearly 97 hours per week to afford the average two bedroom home that's more than two full-time jobs meaning that like if you are if you are w working two full-time jobs you're not going to be able to afford a two-bedroom home. Even if you put two full-time workers together, so if you combine two workers' incomes together, you're still not going to be able to afford a two-bedroom home. <laughs> so, like, when we're, to, when we're talking about how millennials have been screwed over, it's literally by stuff like this, which is a direct impact of, uh, of uh, boomers, you know? And boomer policies. 
Let's see. The pandemic exacerbated housing issues with low-wage workers facing the brunt of job loss. They were also more likely to contract COVID-19. Additionally, the report finds that Black and Latino workers are more likely to spend more of their income on rent as they make less, on average, than white workers. Over 40% of Black and Latino households spend more than 30% of their income on rent compared to 25% of white households. Um, so, I mean, just like looking at that disparity alone, yeah, we need we need to do something about that. That reminds me I need to look for a new place because I can no longer afford the place I'm in. Yeah, like, I live with my parents because I, it's... Where am I going to go? I don't make enough money to, like, live on my own with, like, my medical and uh, insurance bills. Like, nah, nah, nah. <sighs> Instead, I just hustle and hope that I get lucky one day, <laughs> you know? Uh, of course, though... This is just the average. This is just an average. The average worker on full-time, working a full-time job at minimum wage, wouldn't be able to afford a one-bedroom one apartment. And wouldn't be able to afford a two-bedroom even if they had two incomes together. Now, let's take a look at a more specific example. Because as you might imagine, it's worse in some places than it is in others. <laughs> Report shows San Franciscans on minimum wage need to work 4.9 jobs to make rent. Literally in cities where labor is needed, people who work full-time would need to work five full-time jobs just to make rent. Just to make rent. You would need to work 196 hours in order to make rent at minimum wage in San Francisco. Which, to do the math for you, is more hours than there are in a week. Or have five full-time incomes. Yeah, in order to afford rent, you need to get four of your friends to pool your money together in order to live in one apartment. That's a two-bedroom apartment for five people at minimum wage. Just move is the dumbest shit I've ever heard. Yeah, exactly. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. You need people to work in cities. Like, uh, again, this, this this is why eventually we're going to hit a point where I think um, desperation is going to give birth to uh, some kind of general strike. Let's see how easy it is for uh, high-end uh, wealthy people to do their jobs when there's no minimum workers around doing their jobs because they can't afford to live on the wages they get paid. <laughs> 